Hello everyone, welcome to my Last of Us Remastered, Grounded Difficulty, no damage, no crafting, no upgrades, no safes, no shave doors, no training manuals walkthrough. And this is Billstown, which is one of my favorite chapters in this game. Not only do we get introduced to a very memorable character, but this character named Bill gets into some of the most memorable confrontations with Ellie, and it's so hilarious. And not only that, but for Billstown, we will be fighting only Infected, and the encounters with the Infected are a lot of fun, and they really work well. I mean, there are some sequences in Billstown that are a little questionable in their designs, and this is mainly the case with the school section, when you're outside of the school, but I'll get to that when I get there. Uh, but ra right now, we picked up the bow and arrow, and the bow and arrow on this game is so much more reliable than the bow and arrow from The Last of Us Part 2, because... Not only does it utilize a almost laser-sighted system where you can actually see the path that the arrow is going to take, but it can also kill human enemies in one hit, which is fantastic and it makes the bow and arrow incredibly reliable for stealth encounters. The bow and arrow in The Last of Us Part 2 on Survivor difficulty takes two shots to kill enemies and you have to go for headshots if you want to guarantee an instant kill, or if you're trying to make sure that you kill the enemies in two hits, you have to aim for the leg and then kill them, so that they don't alert enemies after being hit by the first arrow. Which is a very clunky process, and it just seems very unnecessary for a stealth weapon. The bow and arrow on this game is, works exactly as intended. You shoot that bow and arrow, you have the right amount of aim, and it kills enemies in one hit. It is very reliable, it takes skill to use, and you get rewarded in the end. And I just wish the, the bow and arrow in the second Last of Us had that very same feature, but it doesn't. And right now, we are in a hanging sequence where we are only allowed to use the revolver. And I believe you have unlimited ammo, but the game will still take ammunition away from you. I don't know how the game calculates how much revolver ammo you're allowed to get at the end of this fight, but it's a little confusing. And once we get up here, the infected will not be able to harm you, and they're going to be going after Ellie, and you don't have to worry about Ellie whatsoever. She can't die unless the enemies grab her, and you see that icon above their heads indicating that Ellie is about to be killed. That's the only time Ellie is under threat, and it's very easy to shake the enemies off. It's really, really good design. I mean, on the second Last of Us, the allies don't get grabbed so much. And there was even an accessibility feature that allowed you to turn off the moments where allies could get grabbed, so they would shake out of the grab every single time. It's a pretty cool feature, but it's kind of unnecessary because the AI is very capable in the second Last of Us. I can't even remember the last time my partner's ever been grabbed. The only time I ever see my AI partner getting grabbed is with Dina when you're in the courthouse garage because the enemies really spread out, and a lot of them prioritize Dina rather than you, so that's why you get moments where the AI gets grabbed. And the only other sequence I can remember from the second Last of Us where my AI partners were getting grabbed was when you're in that warehouse at the beginning of uh, Abby's section of Seattle Day 1. That was another moment where uh, your AI partners could get grabbed, but it wasn't that big of a deal. And that is the end of that hanging section, and Bill is not going to save us, and now we have to run for our lives. And fun fact about this sequence, if you don't pick up the revolver back in Boston, and you start this hanging sequence, the game will automatically give you the revolver. So much like the 9mm pistol and the shotgun, the game classes the revolver as a mandatory weapon, which I find it very odd that they would class it as a mandatory weapon, yet they allow you the option to pick up the revolver in an earlier section, and you don't even have to do so. Seems very odd that they would do that. But I'm fine with it, because The Last of Us 1 and The Last of Us Part 2 flow better when you're using all the weapons, because the enemies have to be respected in the, in the Last of Us series. It's the same reason why I liked Resident Evil 7 and Resident Evil 4, because of the fact that the enemies were very lethal, and because of the kind of scenarios you were put into, you had to use every single weapon intelligently, and each of the weapons felt like they gave off a different kind of feedback, and they felt like they mattered. You know, in games like Resident Evil 2 Remake, where that whole entire game is just designed for knife only and the weapons really don't feel that reliable, there's never any need to use the weapons. If you were to use the weapons in Resident Evil 2 Remake, it would practically feel like New Game Plus. Because everything in that game is just so simple, the enemy designs are so simple, the enemy types just don't demand anything whatsoever, so that's why it's very easy to do that game knife only. And there aren't that many diverse scenarios that the game is putting you into when they're mixing up the enemy types in a way that demands use of every single weapon. And 
that's why I've never really appreciated the Resident Evil games that are designed for knife only, because if the Resident Evil games are designed for knife only, there's no incentive to pick up any ammunition, there's no incentive to pick up any of the weapons, you simply go from point A to point B, just figuring out the enemy patterns, and then figuring out the simplistic movesets of the enemies, and that's it. And very rarely will I ever come across a game that I feel like is designed for knife only, but it doesn't settle on such simple designs. And that was what I got with Resident Evil 7 on the end of Zoe DLC, because that whole entire DLC can be done fist only. I mean, there are definitely scenarios where I feel like using your equipment is better than just simply using your fists. But you can do that entire DLC fist only if you know how to use your environment correctly, if you know how to isolate the enemies correctly. And the enemies are actually challenging. They're not as simple in their designs compared to Resident Evil 2 Remake. And I guess one of the main reasons why the enemy types are so simplistically designed in Resident Evil 2 Remake is because you yourself were simplistically designed. You know, that's why, like, in games like Resident Evil 3, like, the, the inclusion of a dodge was very important. Because it forced the developers to make the enemies a lot less predictable, and that game wasn't really designed for knife only unless you got the correct pattern. And anything that is designed around RNG means it's not designed for that. But even still, though, Resident Evil 3 didn't really get off the ground properly when it came to implementing this new kind of mentality. Resident Evil 4 did it better. The, the new inclusions to the flinch animation systems, the new kinds of improvements they made to the shooting mechanics, the different enemy types you were dealing with. Resident Evil 4 is the perfect example of putting in such advanced systems that complement not only yourself, but also the lethality of the enemies. And it's this kind of mentality that I feel really gave Resident Evil its identity, and this mentality carried on between Resident Evil 4 and Resident Evil 7 before Resident Evil 2 Remake threw that mentality out of the park and they just settled back on the old school design because people complained too much. And as I stated before in my Resident Evil 2 Remake walkthrough, I just could not find the passion necessary to call Resident Evil 2 Remake a Resident Evil game, because it felt so standardized because of the fact that it settled with such an old school mentality. The sky just wasn't the limit whatsoever with that game. They didn't strive for anything great. They just decided to listen too much to their fans, and it practically becomes a cash grab at that point. And people say Resident Evil 3 Remake is a cash grab. Well, Resident Evil 2 Remake feels more like a cash grab than Resident Evil 3 Remake. And I completely understand why people felt that Resident Evil 3 Remake was more of a cash grab than Resident Evil 2 Remake, given that it cut out a lot of content, and it didn't really settle for anything good. But... The only reason it did that was because it was trying to follow the exact same kind of formula as Resident Evil 2 Remake, where it's designed for speedrunning, everything is just so simplistically designed. And I just think that was one of the main reasons why they cut out a lot of content, and... In actuality, I'm kind of glad that a lot of the cut content didn't appear in Resident Evil 3 Remake, such as the park area or the Grave Digger, because I feel like... Resident Evil 3 Remake would have messed up those sections greatly. I mean, they already ruined Nemesis on that game because Nemesis is just so poorly designed. And they had some really poor mentalities associated with the way they implemented his boss fights. It's just so lazy, and I was not happy about it whatsoever. And that's just the kind of results that's expected from an old school mentality like that. And you have all these people saying that Resident Evil 4 is the downfall of survival horror. Well, if you ask me, Resident Evil 4 was survival horror at its apex, when it didn't embrace such artificial designs that just gave the enemies more credit than they deserved. You know, that, that game really strived for so much. Considering that it was Capcom's very first time doing it over the shoulder game, they really went all out with the kind of mechanics that they allowed you to utilize. And then when they further expanded upon these mechanics in Resident Evil 5 and Resident Evil 6 and Resident Evil 7, the, the systems really became something that felt truly next-gen when it comes to mechanics. You know, people view next-gen as being just graphics, and that's it. But that is not what games are about. If you want good graphics, just watch a movie or a cartoon. Graphics only serve to be in the realm of cartoons and movies, never in a game. The only thing that objectively defines a game's place as being a truly spectacular experience is the gameplay. I mean, in this game's case, The Last of Us has mastered gameplay, story, and graphics. It's managed to find the proper balance in its proportions when it comes to those three aspects that define a game properly. And that is why The Last of Us series is one of the best gaming series out there. And relating The Last of Us to what I've just explained about Resident Evil 4, Naughty Dog was very smart to take influences from Resident Evil 4 when they were developing the Last of Us series. 
And seeing as how they kept this mentality intact with the development of The Last of Us Part 2, they honestly became the true masters of survival horror at that point compared to new Capcom who made Resident Evil 2 Remake. And I was initially afraid that Naughty Dog was going to take influences from Resident Evil 2 Remake given the high praise it was receiving, but they didn't. They still stuck with the mentality that objectively makes survival horror games truly phenomenal in a way that doesn't feel so outdated. You know, there are these people who believe that Outlast is the greatest survival horror series out there, but all that game series is is just a horror simulator, not really striving for anything. It just feels very safe, and while it does have some really cool mechanics with the ability to dodge enemies, and the Outlast series can feel very fast compared to your typical horror simulator series, objectively, they don't really work as good survival horror games. And I should know how those people felt, because I originally was among those individuals who believed that Outlast was the best survival horror series out there, because I didn't understand how to properly judge games back then. And then when I played Outlast 2, which was awful, I really started to develop the correct mindset for judging these kind of survival horror games, because Outlast 2 just wasn't scary at all, and it was just such a boring experience. You just weren't engaging with the enemies a lot, and the enemies were really bullcrap on that game. And... I just lost touch with the game very greatly. I mean, I can't really elaborate on my thoughts properly at the moment. I think in order to do so, I'll have to make a walkthrough of the Outlast series, just to lay down my thoughts better, and if I don't have any other projects to worry about. So, stay tuned for a potential walkthrough of the Outlast series. I mean, I still have other projects to worry about for this channel. I have to continue my walkthrough of The Evil Within 2, and then I have to continue my walkthrough of Resident Evil 2 Remake. And then... I am planning on doing a walkthrough of Bioshock 1, although I might not do Bioshock 2 or Bioshock Infinite, seeing as how Bioshock 1 is the only game I've really played. But who knows, maybe I'll do Bioshock 2 and Bioshock Infinite, because it would just seem odd to do a walkthrough of Bioshock 1 and then not do the rest of the Bioshock series. And I am currently playing through Bioshock 1 right now, and I'm up to the medical pavilion, because I've been busy farming big daddies using a strategy that I've, I've discovered. And... I'm not really enjoying Bioshock 1. I mean, I can understand why people like Bioshock 1, but they're only judging it based on the story. But the gameplay doesn't really tether me that well to the story, and I'm not finding a lot of incentive to continue playing through the game. Like, the gameplay on Bioshock 1 is just very unpolished, and there's just a lot of really big problems with hitboxes. There's a lot of really annoying issues with certain mechanics of that game, and it's just turning into a very frustrating experience. And Bioshock 1 is just very unpolished for a console game. And it's about as unpolished and outdated as some of your PC exclusive games, because a lot of PC exclusive games still cling on to mentalities that might have worked back in a previous generation when games just weren't as very innovative or as properly polished as they are right now. But they're still clinging on to that, and it's just unacceptable. And I'm, I'll elaborate further on this when I do my Bioshock walkthrough. But right now, we're outside of the school area, and this entire section, you can stealth the first part, but you're always going to get into a mandatory combat encounter for the second phase. So, it completely destroys any incentive to really stealth the first phase, which I find to be very perplexing. This is really the only part of the game where the game forces you to go into mandatory combat. It's really dumb that it works like that. And right now... I'm just getting rid of the enemies. I'm easily isolating them. This is not hard. And the second phase isn't even that hard. Because I'm going to be able to camp on top of a bus and isolate the enemies easily. So long as my other two AI partners aren't up on the bus with me. Because if my other two AI partners are up on the bus, they'll get in the way. And they'll lure too many enemies to me. So I'll have to jump off the bus and repeat the process. It's something that I really wish was not a thing. And... Like I said before in my first part of this walkthrough, there are some very questionable design choices with certain sections of this game, and they border on bugginess. And you're seeing one of those questionable design choices right now, but it's not because of bugginess, it's all to do with a really dumb design that doesn't properly reward a stealthy playstyle. It's just really dumb that it works this way, and now I'm going to have to resort to this strategy, which is a very effective strategy. And you're seeing a unique animation that is very rare, where you can actually kick enemies off of high places. And um, one criticism I do have with these context-sensitive animations is it doesn't seem to matter how many hits you put on an enemy. The context-sensitive animation seems to trigger regardless of how many hits you deal towards an enemy. And um, I'm not even sure why it works this way. Like, right there. That was two hits, and then he did the kick. And I was able to kill that enemy, but then there are other moments where I hit the enemy five times, and then it does the context-sensitive animation. 
there's not really any consistency with it, and it's one of my main criticisms with the context-sensitive animations on this game. Like, with the enemies, the enemies, if you are near a wall and they try to melee you, they will always get the priority on a context-sensitive animation. They will cancel whatever you're doing and just push you against the wall, and they do it on the very first instance of starting it. So why the heck should the enemies have something like that, but then you don't have anything like that? That doesn't make any sense to me, and it's just something that really feels like an artificial handicap that causes the enemies to feign lethality. And add that to the fact that you can't dodge on this game, you get a lot of really annoying issues when the enemies do their attacks on you. So exert a lot of caution when it comes to placing yourself in a spot where you're near a wall, because the enemies are always going to get the priority on their context-sensitive animations. And seeing as how we're talking about melee, I should discuss something about the melee. So... As much like the second Last of Us, this game utilizes a paired animation system for the melee, and what that means is, regardless of your distance, you will essentially glide towards the enemy in order to make a hit with them, and this is the same case with the enemies. I mean, it's not 100% distance, if you get enough momentum, you can avoid these paired animation attacks. But when it comes to grabs, whenever the runners do their grabs and you don't successfully interrupt them by punching them, they will always be able to grab you because of the paired animation nature. At least in The Last of Us Part 2, you had the ability to dodge, so the paired animation nature of the melee wasn't really that big of a deal in The Last of Us Part 2, so long as you were actively aware of enemies and you were dodging accordingly. And the only time it was ever really a problem was when you did a finishing blow on an enemy, and because of that, you had a bit of delay on your dodge input, so you couldn't dodge for a few seconds, and then the enemy's been able to grab you, or just attack you, and it could be very bullcrap because of that. That was really the only time that I really recall any moments of having trouble with the paired animation nature of the melee. And, by the way, right now, I've killed most of the enemies. I always do this sequence in combat because the game gives you a lot of bricks and bottles for the sequence. And right now, I'm about to show you how to punch clickers. So, the game tells you punching a clicker is ineffective, so you have to try a melee weapon, but you can still punch clickers. Uh, you cannot do that in the second Last of Us. If you try punching clickers, they will not react, they will not flinch, and they will just hyper-armor through your attack and just grab you. The safest time to ever melee a clicker with your fist is when they're actively engaging with your AI partner. So if they grabbed an AI partner, or your AI partner is meleeing the clicker, that is the safest time to start to melee the clicker with your fist. And if you do the running melee attack, you will do a lot more damage. And you have to build up a lot of momentum if you want to do that particular attack. Also, something I forgot to mention about the stun that's elicited by throwing bricks and bottles at an enemy. Um, you notice that I do it a lot when I'm grabbing infected. So I throw a brick or a bottle at an infected, and then I grab them. Well, believe it or not, during that animation, you are completely invulnerable to melee attacks that the infected can do. But you're very vulnerable when you come out of the animation. And because of the fact that it's not really easy to initiate a melee attack on enemies that are off camera whenever you come out of the animation, you have to make sure that you time your finishing kill on an enemy that's been grabbed so that you are perfectly facing the enemy that you're having to deal with. That way, they're not going to be able to attack you so quickly. And um, also, um, the enemies can still damage you during the solar frames of grabbing the enemy, so you gotta be very careful with that. As long as you are in the neutral state of just keeping the enemy in a grabbing state, you will not be able to take damage from any enemies doing melee attacks. You, you will still take damage from enemies firing weapons, which is why it's not very effective against humans. Although, the human shield mechanic is still very reliable in stopping the enemies from firing at you. And the human shield mechanic on this game is so overpowered compared to the second Last of Us. Because you can hold the enemies for such a long time, and the game actually gives a proper signal for when the enemy is about to break out of the grab. Whereas in the second Last of Us, the enemies broke out of the grab very quickly. And it oftentimes was very hard to tell if the enemy was about to break out of the grab or not. But I use the human shield mechanic a lot in this game when it comes to opening the enemies up to a position where they're not going to be firing at me, they go out of cover, and then I'm able to shoot one enemy in the head, and then I try to get rid of the other enemies as quickly as possible so that they do not kill the human that I currently have as a shield. This is especially helpful for certain encounters in Pittsburgh. The very first combat encounter in Pittsburgh, you can use the human shield mechanic as a way of getting rid of the three enemies that have guns, and then you have that one melee guy, and then the rest of the enemies responding in, and you have plenty of time to get rid of the melee guy, and then sneak back into a stealth profile. It's so helpful. I cannot wait to demonstrate the human shield mechanic on this game. 
but now we have a boss fight with a bloater, and be very careful with the bloaters on this game. They're very omniscient when it comes to throwing their mycotoxic sacks at you. They throw their mycotoxic sacks in the path that you're going, rather than at you. So, you have to be very precise on your movements, and you need to move in such a way that that piece of programming is not going to be an issue when it comes to running towards them. And then, once you've gotten towards him, use one Molotov, and then finish him off with your shotgun. It is so good because Molotovs are so powerful against boulders, as I explained previously in the first part of this walkthrough. That is exactly how a lethal but fair enemy should be. And you don't get that in the Last of Us Part 2, unfortunately. Even though six shotgun shells are very powerful against boulders. I discovered that in my walkthrough and I was so surprised. But even still though, the fact that you can't use Molotovs intelligently as a way of getting rid of high tier enemies in the second Last of Us is so disappointing. And I'm not happy about it whatsoever. I think it's a really dumb design choice. But after you kill this guy, there's going to be a spawn of three runners. And I killed the first two runners with the shotgun. And you cannot melee these guys. They're not active at the moment. Their hitbox aren't currently active while they're descending down into this room. So wait for them to finish their animations and then start punching them. And once you deal with these guys, that is the end of this encounter. And funny thing, even when you kill the bloater, if you end up taking damage on this part or you die to these three enemies, it will respawn you at the beginning of the bloater fight, which is hilarious. And that's something I forgot to mention about grounded difficulty. Grounded difficulty removes certain checkpoints, and I am glad because there are times when getting checkpoints in the middle of the encounter screws with the flow of the encounter, and it makes doing the strategies a little bit harder than necessary. So I'm glad that they've removed certain checkpoints, and it practically is no different to the restart encounter option that you get in The Last of Us Part 2, so it's not a big deal whatsoever. But right now, the game is giving the impression that there are a lot of enemies closing in on you, but there actually isn't. There are only four enemies. There are two spawn points, and they each have two enemies. So, I'm going to use this time to get any additional shotgun ammo that these enemies drop, or any other kind of ammunition. It's very reliable, so that is the end of this first spawn right here, and then this next spawn over here, there's going to be an another two enemies. And hopefully they drop shotgun ammo, and I believe they do. And this is going to be very helpful, because the next sequence coming up, you need a lot of shotgun ammo. And the game does give you a lot of shotgun ammo within the house before you start the sequence. But just to be on the safe side, it's best you try to get shotgun ammo from these enemies before progressing onwards. The next encounter is pretty tough if you don't have the resources necessary to pull it off. Because there's a lot of runners, there's a lot of clickers, and they put a lot of pressure on you. You will get bricks and bottles for the sequence, but there aren't that many. So you have to be very reliant upon your shotgun. And this is really the last part of the game where you need the shotgun. Every other part of the game afterwards, the shotgun can be used as an optional weapon. And... Compared to the Last of Us Part 2 shotgun, this shotgun is pretty inferior because it doesn't have that wide of a spread and you have to be really close to the enemies in order to guarantee you get an instant kill. Shotgun in the second Last of Us is a Resident Evil 4 shotgun because it has a very wide spread and it deals a lot of damage regardless of the kind of distance you're at so you don't have to get so close to the enemy in order to deal high damage capabilities. And I should probably be talking about the uh, other equipment we picked up, uh, the Nail Bomb. So. The Nail Bomb is a very damaging tool, it can be very helpful against groups, but that's not where the Nail Bombs shine. The Nail Bombs are easily the most overpowered piece of equipment by far, because you can use them as an infinite distraction. And it takes advantage of the way the distractions work on this game, where when you use a distraction, all the enemies will turn towards the distraction, but only one enemy will investigate. And as I mentioned before in the first part of my walkthrough, this isn't the case for every single section, but this works for most of the game, and it's especially helpful for one encounter in Pittsburgh, where it's nighttime, and you're trying to sneak out of Pittsburgh with Henry and Sam, and you have that encounter where you have the people on that light, and you have all these enemies closing in on you, and you can use the nail bomb as a way of dealing with the enemies, and not have to deal with the RNG factor of their random paths. And what you can do is you go to this one isolated spot, throw the nail bomb in that location, pick it up, and then go to some other location, wait for the enemy to go and investigate, get behind him, and then finish him off. And you can repeat this process with the other enemies, and the best part is, when the enemies are investigating destructions, they will completely ignore any dead bodies until they complete their animation cycle of investigating the destructions. So, they will not be able to alert enemies to any dead bodies while they're investigating the destruction. It's incredibly broken and unbelievable. 
they fixed this issue in the second Last of Us, where in the second Last of Us, while the enemies are in a state where they're investigating the destruction, they can see dead bodies. And then they removed the nail bombs from the second Last of Us and replaced it with a piece of equipment I never used, which is the trap mines. And the trap mines are on that game are very useless. They really don't serve any purpose. I mean, they are very damaging when they do detonate, but the fact that they serve as more of a tripwire function rather than as a bomb you can throw is one of the main reasons why I don't use them. And the only time I've ever used the trap mines is when I'm trying to deal with the bloater, but that was before I discovered the strategy where you just use six shotgun shells on the bloater. So, overall, I would really say the equipment on this game is far more reliable than the equipment you get in the second Last of Us. But right now, this is the end of the encounter. Just make your way over to the truck. Uh, don't bother trying to shoot any of the enemies. They have infinite health. And once you've done the sequence, that will be the end of Bill's Town. Uh, something I should mention. If you get too far away from Ellie while you're dealing with the enemies, an enemy will spawn and try to grab Ellie. So bear that in mind when you're doing the sequence. But that is the end of Bill's Town. Stay tuned for the future parts. Thank you all for watching. And you take care now.